Hey guys! So if you are watching from the Cats True Crime and Makeup YouTube channel, just so you know, please go ahead and use my original YouTube channel instead, Catalina Lupsa, because I'm going to keep this channel only as a backup and usually the videos that I publish will be uh, published first on my original YouTube channel, Catalina Lupsa. So, on, uh, so if you are watching from Cats True Crime and Makeup channel, you will see the videos later. And yes, before anybody says anything in the comments, yes, I did uh, do something to my hair, but this is not the end of it. This is just a couple of shades lighter before I actually put the color that I want. So probably in the next video, you will be seeing the end result. I'm doing it by myself, so I have no idea how it's going to turn out, but yeah, it should be fine anyway. Side note, I haven't dyed my hair since I was a teenager, probably 14 or 15 years old. So this is the first time that I'm actually trying something new to my hair, apart from usually having a cut. Okay, so let's just get started. In the early hours of March 13, 1964, Kitty was brutally assaulted outside her apartment building in the Kew Gardens neighborhood of Queens. Two weeks after the tragic incident, the New York Times published an article which said that 38 witnesses saw or heard the attack but they did nothing to help Kitty or to contact the police. This led to investigations into what later became known as the bystander effect or Genovese syndrome. Kitty's murder is what led to the creation of the 911 system in the US. Up until then, there was no emergency number that you could call. So, let's find out what happened. But before we do that, just quickly, the word in Romanian is urgență. 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 Well done, guys. You just said emergency. And I just want to give my thanks to Alf for suggesting this video. Catherine Susan Genovese, also known as Kitty, was born in Brooklyn, New York City, in the US, of course, on July the 7th, 1935. She was the oldest of five children born to Rachel and Vincent Andronel Genovese who were of Italian-American descent. They lived in a brownstone residence at 29 St. John's Place in Park Slope, a neighborhood in Western Brooklyn known for its predominantly Italian and Irish families. Vincent ran Bay Ridge Coat and Apron Supply Company and Rachel was a homemaker. Growing up, Kitty was raised in the Catholic faith and from an early age, Kitty was known for her energy and her zest for life. She was also known to be a chatterbox who was popular in school and enjoyed her English and music classes the best. She attended Prospect Heights High School, an all-girls school, during her teenage years. She was remembered by her peers as having a maturity beyond her age and a positive attitude. In 1954, after Kitty's mother witnessed a murder, the family actually decided to move to New Canaan, Connecticut. However, Kitty stayed behind in Brooklyn with her grandparents to get ready for her upcoming marriage. She had recently graduated from high school. Unfortunately, Kitty's marriage was a really short marriage and it was actually an old before the year ended because Kitty identified herself as being a lesbian. Kitty simply loved New York City and following her move to an apartment in Brooklyn, she found herself working in various clerical positions which she didn't particularly like. So in the late 1950s, she finally got a job as a bartender. However, her new job wouldn't last for very long as she was arrested in 1961, in August 1961. Kitty had been engaged in bookmaking activities, taking bets on horse races from patrons at the bar that she worked at. And this incident resulted in her and her friend, D. Garnieri, being fined $50 each, which would be the equivalent of $490. This eventually led Kitty to lose her job. Kitty then had another bartending job at Eve's 11th Hour Bar, 
located on Jamaica Avenue and 193rd Street in Hollis, Queens. Kitty was a really hard worker and she was very dedicated to her work so she quickly rose to a management position overseeing the operations of the bar on behalf of the owner who wasn't there very often but Kitty's dream was to open an Italian restaurant so she really worked hard to get there. She would work long hours even pulling double shifts in order to save enough money. Even with a really busy and draining schedule she stayed focused on her goal and this is who Kitty was because Kitty consistently worked double shifts. She did really well financially and I mean really well earning an income of $750 a month which would be the equivalent of $7,800 today. She was committed to saving up for her life's dream. An independent woman, Kitty, would usually tell her father when there would be conversations about her finding a husband she would always tell her father, no man could support me because I make more than a man. On March 13, 1963, Kitty met Mary Ann Zelonko at Swing Rendezvous, which was an underground lesbian bar in Greenwich Village. They quickly fell in love and they decided to move in together. They found an apartment next to the Long Island Railroad Station in Kew Gardens, a neighborhood in Queens. It was a second floor flat, one of 14 similar units in a two-story building with storefronts on the, on the ground floor and apartments upstairs. The ladies were each other's support system throughout their journey. They would frequent the folk music scene and on Monday nights they would go to Gerdis Folk City in Greenwich Village. Although they were lovers, this was frowned upon, so people in Kew Gardens know, knew them only as roommates. On March 13, 1964, at around 2.30 a.m., Kitty, as usual, left the bar she worked at and got into her red Fiat to drive home. She was really excited and looking forward to get home because it was the couple's one-year anniversary. While she was waiting for a traffic light to change on Hoover Avenue, Winston Mosley, who was sitting in his parked Chevrolet Corvair, actually noticed her. Winston was on the hunt for a victim carrying in his pocket a serrated hunting knife. After noticing Kitty, Winston made a U-turn and followed her. Around 45 minutes later, Kitty got home and parked her car in the Kew Gardens Long Island Railroad Station parking lot. This lot was around 100 feet or 30 meters away from her apartment's door at the back of the building. As she went towards her apartment complex, Winston Mosley, who was following her from the traffic light, got out of his car, which he parked at the corner bus stop on Austin Street. He approached Kitty armed with a hunting knife. So who is this guy, Winston Mosley? Winston Mosley, who was born in 1935, was 29 years old at the time of this case. He was from Ozone Park, Queens, and he worked at Remington Rand as a tab operator, preparing the punched cards used at the time mainly for data input for digital computers. He was married with three children and he had no criminal record. So, on March 13, as Kitty walked to her apartment, she heard some footsteps. Scared, she began to run towards the front of the building, but Winston quickly caught up to her. He stabbed her twice in the back, and being in so much pain and terror, Kitty let out a piercing scream, desperately calling for help. While a few of the neighbors heard her cry, only a few really understood the gravity of the situation. Among them was Robert Moser. As Kitty was calling out, Oh God, I've been stabbed, Robert saw the struggle and he shouted, Leave that girl alone. Scared off, Winston fled the scene, leaving Kitty behind. Kitty got to her feet and even though she was severely injured, she tried to make it to the entrance to her apartment where her girlfriend was asleep, but Kitty sadly collapsed in the vestibule at the bottom of the stairs. 
Unfortunately, this isolated path meant that there were no witnesses to her suffering. Winston was seen by witnesses as he got back into his car 100 yards away and he just sat in it. He was initially scared off but he settled down after he realized that the police were not coming. Winston killed before and so he was determined to finish what he started. He got out of his car and eventually and tragically he found Kitty bleeding and terrified. He deliberately hid his face with a white brimmed hat whilst searching for Kitty in the parking lot, train station and apartment complex. Kitty was barely conscious and lying in the hallway at the back of the building. She had been trying to get inside but she couldn't because of a blocked door. After he found Kitty, Winston stabbed her several more times and then horrifically raped her. And after he was done, he just stood up, dusted himself off, stole $49 from Kitty's wallet before fleeing once again. He left her alive but barely breathing. The series of attacks lasted for around half an hour during which Kitty's hands had knife wounds indicating an attempt to defend herself. Shortly after the second attack, a concerned neighbor and friend of Kitty's, Sophie Farrar, heard the commotion and came to help her, holding her in her arms and comforting her. Oh, and side note, by the way, this, if you're wondering, I actually got it because I burnt myself in the oven door as I was making pizza. So Susan was holding Kitty and comforting her, whispering words like help is on the way and uh, Sophia stayed with Kitty until an ambulance finally arrived at almost 4 a.m. more than 30 minutes after the initial attack a neighbor Carl Ross finally called police and NYPD patrolman Clarence Cron arrived quickly after along with the ambulance at about 4.15 a.m. but sadly it was too late. Kitty Genovese passed away in the ambulance on the way to the Queen's General Hospital. Marianne, Kitty's girlfriend, was the one awakened by the police to go and identify Kitty's body in the morgue. The coroner's report indicated that Kitty had 13 stab wounds and numerous defensive wounds. Kitty fought hard and she may have lived if help would have arrived before the second time that she was attacked by Winston. Mary Ann was interviewed by Detective Mitchell Sang at 7 a.m. the day after Kitty's murder. She underwent a six-hour interrogation conducted by two homicide detectives, John Carroll and Jerry Burns. The detectives primarily focused their questioning on her relationship with Kitty. The same line of inquiry was pursued by the police when they interviewed the neighbors of the couple. Initially, Mary Ann was regarded as a potential suspect. On March 19, 1964, six days after Kitty's stabbing, Winston Mosley was arrested for suspected robbery in Ozone Park after a TV set was discovered in the trunk of his car. His car was searched after a local man, Raul Cleary, became suspicious when he saw Winston removing the TV from a neighbor's house. So Raul questioned Winston who claimed to be a removal worker. However, after speaking with another, with another neighbor, Jack Brown, who confirmed that the homeowners were not moving, Raul called the police. Jack disabled Winston's car to make, to make sure that he couldn't get away before police arrived. A detective remembered that a white car similar to Winston's had been reported by some of the witnesses to Kitty's murder and he informed the detectives Carol and Sang. During questioning, Winston admitted to the murders of Kitty and two other women. Annie Mae Johnson, who was shot and burned to death in her apartment in South Ozone Park a few weeks earlier, and 15-year-old Barbara Kralik, who had been killed in her parents' Springfield Gardens home the previous July. While in custody, Winston, like I said, he confessed to killing Kitty. He detailed the attack, corroborating the physical evidence at the scene. 
he said that his motive for the attack was simply to kill a woman, saying he preferred to kill women because they were easier and didn't fight back. He stated that he got up that night at around 2 a.m. while his wife was working nights as a registered nurse and he drove through Queens to find the victim. Winston saw Kitty on her way home and followed her to the parking lot before killing her. See, he also confessed to murdering and sexually assaulting two other women and to committing between 30 to 40 burglar burglaries. Future psychiatric examinations would suggest that Winston Mosley was actually a necrophile. Winston Mosley was charged with the murder of Kitty, but he wasn't charged with the other two murders that he admitted to, the murder of Annie Mae Johnson and 15-year-old Barbara Kralik. For the police, one of the issues was that another man, Alvin Mitchell, also confessed to the murder of Barbara Kralik. Winston's trial began on June the 8th, 1964, and was presided over by Judge J. Irwin Shapiro. Winston initially pleaded not guilty, but his attorney later changed his plea to not guilty by reason of insanity. During his testimony, Winston described the events of the night he murdered Kitty, along with the two other murders to which he had confessed, and numerous other burglaries and rapes. The jury deliberated for seven hours before returning a guilty verdict at around 10.30 p.m. on June 11th. On June 15, Winston Mosley was sentenced to death for the murder of Kitty Genovese. When the jury foreman read the sentence, Winston showed no emotion while some spectators applauded and cheered. The judge added, I don't believe in capital punishment, but when I see a monster like this, I wouldn't hesitate to pull the switch myself. On June 23rd, Winston Mosley appeared as a defense witness in the trial of Alvin Mitchell for the murder of Barbara Kralik. After being granted immunity from prosecution, he testified that he had killed Barbara. The trial led to a hung jury, but Alvin Mitchell was actually convicted in a second trial. On June the 1st, 1967, the New York Court of Appeals found that Winston should have been able to argue that he was medically insane at the sentencing hearing when the trial court found that he had been legally sane and because of this, the sentence was reduced to life imprisonment. On March 18, 1968, Winston Mosley escaped from prison while being transported back from Meyer Memorial Hospital in Buffalo, New York, where he underwent minor, minor surgery for a self-inflicted injury. He hit the transporting correctional officer, then stole his weapon and fled to a nearby vacant house. Owned by a Grand Island couple, Mr. and Mrs. Matthew Kulaga, where he stayed undetected for three days. On March 21st, the Kulagas went to check on the house, where they found Winston, who held them hostage for more than one hour, binding and gagging Matthew and raping Mrs. Kulaga. He then took their car and he fled. Winston traveled to Grand Island, where on March 22nd, he broke into another house and held a woman and her daughter hostage for two hours before releasing them unharmed. He surrendered to police shortly afterward and he was charged with escape and kidnapping, to which he pleaded guilty. He was given two additional 15-year sentences to run concurrently with his life sentence. In September 1971, Winston participated in the Attica prison riot. If you are not aware, the Attica Prison Riot, also known as the Attica Prison Rebellion, Uprising or the Massacre, started on September the 9th, 1971 and, and ended on September 13 with the highest number of, fatal of fatalities in the history of U.S. prison uprisings. Of the 43 men who died, 33 inmates and 10 correctional officers and employees, all but one guard and three inmates were killed by law enforcement gunfire 
when the state retook control of the prison on the final day of the uprising. Etika uprising has been described as a historic event in the prisoners' rights movement. Later, in the same decade, Winston obtained a Bachelor of Arts in Sociology from, in prison from Niagara University. He became eligible for parole in 1984. During his first parole hearing, he told the parole board that the notoriety he faced because of his crimes made him a victim, stating, for a victim outside, it's a one time or one hour or one minute affair, but for the person who's caught, it's forever. My God, that, that man, clearly you can tell that he's got absolutely no remorse. At the same hearing, Winston claimed that he never intended to kill Kitty and that he considered her murder to be a mugging because people do kill people when they mug them sometimes. The board, of course, that they denied his request for parole. Thank God for that. He then returned for a parole hearing on March 13, 2008, the 44th anniversary of Kitty's murder. He continued to show very little remorse for Kitty's murder and parole was, of course, again denied. Kitty's brother, Vincent, was unaware of the 2008 hearing until he was contacted by reporters for the New York Daily News. It said that Vincent never recovered from his sister's murder. This brings back what happened to her, Vincent had said. The whole family remembers. Winston was denied parole an 18th time in November 2015 and he died in prison on March 28, 2016 at the age of 81. He had served 52 years, making him one of the longest serving inmates in the New York State prison system. Kitty's murder didn't really receive much, much immediate attention until the New York City Police Commissioner Michael J. Murphy had lunch with the New York Times Metropolitan Editor A.M. Rosenthal. The police commissioner mentioned Kitty's murder to motivate the Times into publishing an investigative report. The New York Times editor later quoted the police commissioner as saying that Queen's story is one for the books. Michael J. Murphy succeeded and the article was written by Martin Gensberg and published on March 27, 1964, two weeks after Kitty's murder. This article claimed that 38 witnesses saw the murder, but an error reduced the number of witnesses by one in the headline. The headline said 37 who saw murder didn't call the police. This was quoted and reproduced since 1964 with a corrected headline of 38 who saw murder didn't call the police. The public view of the Kitty Genovese story crystallized around a quote from the article by an unidentified neighbor who saw part of the attack but questioned himself before finally getting another neighbor to call the police saying, I didn't want to get involved. Many people saw the story of Kitty's murder as a lack of care or interest in human life in big cities and New York in particular. Science fiction author Harlan Ellison stated that 38 people watched Kitty get knifed to death in a New York street. His June 1988 article in the, mag in the magazine of fantasy and science fiction referred to the murder as witnessed by 38 neighbors, not one of whom made the slightest effort to safeguard, to scream at the killer or even to call the police. He cited reports which he claimed he read that one man viewing the murder from his third floor apartment window stated later that he rushed to turn up his radio so he wouldn't hear the woman's screams. Public reaction to murders happening in the neighborhood apparently didn't change. According to a New York Times article dated December 28, 1974, 10 years after Kitty's murder, 25-year-old Sandra Zeller was beaten to death early Christmas morning in an apartment within a building which overlooked the site of Kitty's attack. Neighbors again said that they heard screams and fear struggles, but they did nothing. In an interview on NPR on March the 3rd, 2014, Kevin Cook, author of Kitty Genovese, The Murder, The Bystanders, The Crime That Changed America, said, 
38 witnesses that was the story that came from the police and it really is what made the story stick over the course of many months of research i wound up finding a document that was a collection of the first interviews oddly enough there were 49 witnesses i was puzzled by that until i added up the entries themselves some of them were interviews with two or three people who lived in the same apartment I believe that some hurried civil servant gave that number to the police commissioner who gave it to the New York Times editor and it entered the modern history of America after that. The apparent lack of reaction by numerous neighbors said to have watched the scene or to have heard Kitty's cries for help prompted research into diffusion of responsibility and the bystander effect. Social psychologists John M. Darley and B. Blatan started this line of research showing that despite common expectations, larger numbers of bystanders decrease the likelihood that someone will step forward and help a victim. The reasons include the fact that onlookers see that others are not helping either, that onlookers believe others will know better how to help and that onlookers feel uncertain about helping while others are watching. Kitty's case became a classic feature of social psychology textbooks in the United States and the United Kingdom. In September 2007, American psychologists published an examination of the factual basis of coverage of the Kitty Genovese murder in psychology textbooks. The three authors concluded that the story was more fiction than fact, largely because of the inaccurate newspaper coverage at the time of the incident. More recent investigations have questioned the original version of events. A 2004 article in the New York Times by Jim Reisenberger, published on the 40th anniversary of Kitty Genovese's murder, raised numerous questions about claims in the original Times article. A 2007 study confirmed in 2014 found that many of the alleged facts about the murder were unfounded, stating that there was no evidence for the presence of 38 witnesses or that witnesses observed the murder or that witnesses remained inactive. After Winston Mosley's death in March 2016, the Times called their second story flawed, stating while there was no question that the attack occurred and that some neighbors ignored cries for help, the portrayal of 38 witnesses as fully aware and unresponsive was erroneous. The article grossly exaggerated the number of witnesses and what they had perceived. None saw the attack in its entirety. Only a few had glimpsed parts of it or recognized the cries for help. Many thought that they had heard lovers or drunks quarreling. There were two attacks and not three. And afterward, two people did call the police. A 70-year-old woman ventured out and cradled the dying victim in her arms until they arrived. Miss Genovese died on the way to a hospital. Because of the layout of the apartment complex and the fact that the attacks took place in different locations, no witness saw the entire sequence of events. Investigation by police and prosecutors showed that approximately a dozen individuals heard or saw portions of the attack, but none of them saw or were aware of the entire incident. Only one witness, Joseph Fink, was aware that Kitty was stabbed in the first attack and only Carl Ross was aware of it in the second attack. Many were unaware that an assault or a homicide even took place. Some witnesses believed that what they saw or heard was a domestic dispute or a drunken brawl or a group of friends leaving the bar when Winston first approached Kitty. After the initial attack punctured her lungs, leading to her eventual death from asphyxiation, it's unlikely that Kitty was able to scream at any volume. A 2015 documentary featuring Kitty's brother William discovered that other crime reporters knew of many problems with the story even in 1964. Immediately after the story broke, WNBC police reporter Danny Meehan discovered many inconsistencies in the original article in the Times. 
Danny asks Times reporter Martin Gansberg why his article failed to reveal that witnesses didn't feel that a murder was happening. To which Martin replied, he would have ruined the story. Not wanting to jeopardize his career by attacking a powerful figure like the New York Times editor Rosenthal, the police reporter Danny kept his findings secret and he passed his notes to fellow WNBC reporter Gabe Pressman. Later, Gabe coached a journalism course in which some of his students called Rosenthal and confronted him with the evidence. Rosenthal was quite irritated that his editorial decisions were being questioned by journalism students and berated Gabe Pressman in a phone call. On October 12, 2016, The Times appended an editor's note to the online version of the 1964 article stating that later reporting by The Times and others has called into question significant, uh, significant elements of this account. Good Samaritan laws were passed in New York and elsewhere to encourage people to help victims. In 1968, John Darley and Bibla Tan developed the social psychological concept known as the bystander effect. After becoming interested in the, in the apathetic responses to Kitty Genovese's murder, also sometimes described as Genovese syndrome, the bystander effect rever refers to the phenomenon where individuals are more likely to help when alone than when in the company of others. This resulted in numerous psychological studies about helping behavior and also contributed to the development of, of several Good Samaritan laws. Kitty Genovese's murder had also been credited with prompting the 1968 nationwide adoption of the 911 system. At the time of Kitty's murder, concerned citizens had to dial O for operator or the local police station number which was then relayed to a communications bureau and then passed on to the precinct. This was obviously a time-consuming process which caused severe delays. The story of the witnesses who did nothing is taught in every introduction to psychology textbook in the US and Britain and in many other countries and has been made popularly known through television programs and books and songs even though it has been proven that the initial news articles on Kitty's case were exaggerated. It also now appears that the Kitty Genovese investigation and story was linked to false confessions in other cases. In 2015, Kitty's horrific and haunting murder became the subject of the 2015 Netflix documentary The Witness, which involves Kitty's brother, Bill Genovese, exploring his sister's death. Bill, who was 16 at the time of the murder, was close to Kitty. She was 12 years older than him and she was like a mother to him, but he didn't really know her. Bill lived with the story that no one had Kitty and it haunted him and their family enough to make him want to enlist in the Marines at 19 and help the war effort in Vietnam. He suffered injuries which resulted in the amputation of both legs, but this actually ended up opening doors for him. According to the witness filmmaker, many of the witnesses who are still alive and were able to be located kind of hid themselves, you know, obviously from all the stories out there. However, they were willing to speak with Bill. It seems that none of the witnesses heard or saw all of the attack or even understood what was happening. With two attacks, one was out of view of the other. No two people saw the same thing and no one saw everything. I just really loved the hell out of Kitty, says Bill. We would laugh a lot together. Slowly but surely, in my mind, it became like, man, we have to tell people what she was like. She was pretty extraordinary. For lack of a better term, he says, she was a real pistol. Bill, who is now 76 years old, is a married father and grandfather in Washington, Connecticut. He is a retired administrator of mental health and education organizations. He recalls that 
among his parents and siblings, talk of Kitty's loss was, la was largely buried with her. They stayed away from all the publicity and inquiries. Their mom was deeply affected by what happened and the rest of the family were trying to shield information coming to her. Kitty's mother had a stroke when she was 53 years old, the year after Kitty's murder, and she sadly died in 1992. Their father died in 1969. After their mother passed away, Bill felt that it would be the time to dig deeper into actually what happened the night of Kitty's murder. Bill vividly remembers the red Fiat Kitty drove up from New York City every other weekend or so to the family's home in New Canaan, Connecticut, which she allowed Bill to drive when he was just 15 years old. Bill, Bill, Bill. Bill only recently found out that Kitty was in a lesbian relationship at the time of her death. One of the most, so he only recently just found out, and one of the most surprising discoveries to Bill was learning that a neighbor of Kitty's rushed to her side in her final moments, cradling Kitty while she bled profusely on the floor. The account by the neighbor Sophia Farrar appeared in a day after media report and Sophia repeated this months later at the trial. Kitty's immediate family didn't attend the trial. But Sophia's account vanished immediately from the narrative. Probably because, you know, her story didn't really sell that well. For almost half a century, Kitty's family didn't even know that Kitty died in the arms of a friend. Billy wished his parents knew that and maybe it would have been a comfort to them. While Bill said that some witnesses who heard or saw what was happening were paralyzed by fear and some looked away on purpose, he doesn't blame them. One of the former residents of the apartment said that some neighbors at the time who were tattooed with numbers from Nazi concentration camps maybe were fearful of interacting with police. Others called police only to be told that police had the information already, although only one call to the police was logged. Bill also knows that ambulance crews of the day were allowed only to transport but not to treat victims at the scene. Bill also said, I've come to realize that the whole story of Kitty's death will never be known, but maybe that's why the story continues to fascinate people. And if nothing else, it got us to think about what we owe to each other. And with this, uh, we got to the end of today's case and of today's video. And I just want to say that uh, this kind of debunked the whole uh, 38 witnesses and no one intervened situation. And uh, like you can see from this video, from the information I gave you, which I found online, it's clear that the newspapers, the media at the time, they, they exaggerated and uh, they came up with, uh, you know, their own stories for shock value, which is horrendous really and it's despicable and disgusting in my opinion because you shouldn't attempt to sensationalize someone's death just uh, for the sake of getting the story, of getting a story out there and for the sake of selling. Please, guys, do let me know what do you think about this case. Uh, let me know in the comment section down below. For now, take care, stay safe, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.